Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's my real pleasure to introduce William Palmer today. Um, I can't believe it's been a year since William's joined faculty, and we were so pleased to have him. I think the way to describe William is homegrown, but anyone who knows him, his first love is South Carolina. And if you've been to his office, you should know that as well. Um, William, uh, his med school was University of South Carolina in Columbia, and he did his internal medicine uh, residency here at Mayo Clinic, Florida, and then proceeded with a, a fellowship both in gastroenterology and hepatology, um, in clinical fellowship in transplant hepatology. Mayo is truly, uh, um, William is already truly a three-shield physician. Uh, he, looking through his CV, which is quite impressive for someone as young as he is, uh, he has Mayo Quality Academy Silver and Bronze Certification. He's won awards including the Karras Award for Mayo Clinic Values Council, Internal Medicine Original Research Project of the Year this past year, Gastroenterology and Hepatology Teacher of the Year, and Duval, he's also been active in the Duval County Medical Society, and finally also in research, having 23 peer-reviewed articles, two book chapters, and four editorials. He's an assistant professor of medicine with us now, senior associate consultant, more importantly, one of his loves is education. He's the assistant program director for our fellowship. We're very, he also has been a clinical partner with me as well in the practice redesign that we've done, coming up with interesting, innovative ideas, including the hemochromatosis clinic, which we're going to hear about today. So I want to take this opportunity on behalf of the Division of Gastroenterology to welcome William Palmer. Looking forward to his talk. William. mentor today told me I wouldn't need this microphone, but we're going to do it. Everybody hear me okay? Okay, so thank you everybody for coming to hear a little bit about our clinic. So um, the idea behind starting this clinic was to create something that there isn't anywhere else in the world. Uh, there is no other destination medical center for patients with hereditary hemochromatosis and iron overload. And because of that, we found a gap in coverage, and so we've been delighted to kick this project off um, in June of last year. So. Today we're going to talk a little bit about um, the diagnosis of hemochromatosis, how we make this diagnosis, who's affected, um, how we go about treating these patients, and we're going to hear a little bit about the hereditary hemochromatosis clinic here at Mayo Clinic in Florida uh, and what our goals are and what we've been able to do so far. So hereditary hemochromatosis is a genetic disease of iron overload, okay, through a genetic deficiency patients absorb too much iron, and this iron becomes deposited in a variety of organs, liver, heart, pancreas, endocrine um, organs are all affected by iron overload. Traditionally, the diagnosis has been made with blood tests and sometimes liver biopsies. In 2017, as of currently, we are now able to make many of these diagnoses without liver biopsies because of some advances in radiographic MRI technology, ultrasound-based technology that allows us to stage and diagnose these patients much more efficiently and in many cases without the need for liver biopsy. Treatment uh, typically involves phlebotomy. And I have to tell you that phlebotomy is the reason that I became interested in this disease. Uh, in an era of pharmaceuticals, uh, in an era of advertisement for pharmaceuticals and all the money that we're talking about, what an elegant condition to be able to take blood from somebody who's affected, reduce their chance of disease, reduce their chance of cancer, and give it to somebody else. Cool, right? I think so. So the signs and symptoms of hereditary hemochromatosis. Excess iron deposits in organs, and you get a variety of signs and symptoms. Some of that can be as nonspecific as fatigue, but some as specific as these iron depositions that we find in the second and third metacarpal joints of the hands. We commonly refer to that as the iron fist. Yellowing of the skin, leg swelling, can present with a variety of different uh, organ system dysfunctions, including cirrhosis, which is how I initially got involved in this, heart dysfunctions, conduction abnormalities of the heart, gonadal deficiencies, pancreatic deficiencies in the form of diabetes, joint problems, arthritis, and skin bronzing. Presentations, many patients just show up with a patomegaly or some vague symptoms. We get a lot of referrals for family members that have had 
uh, hereditary hemochromatosis, and so many of those patients don't have any idea that they have the disease at all. So this is a breakdown of the common serum lab test that you would get in the clinic if you're worried about an iron problem, either high or low, okay? So iron, serum iron, is a lab that we'll commonly check. It's important to note that serum iron elevation does not mean iron overload. Serum iron can be elevated for a variety of reasons, including chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease, certain medications. So this is not in a vacuum diagnostic of iron overload. Ferritin, which is a uh, iron storage protein, uh, is commonly what we follow to make the diagnosis. However, this comes with a caveat, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But ferritin is what we refer to as an acute phase reactant, meaning that any inflammation in the body, an infection, a malignancy, uh, sometimes medications, or something as simple as modest alcohol intake can raise your ferritin. So you have to think about ferritin as a, in, a, in a spectrum of the rest of this disease. Your total iron binding capacity or transferrin, which are very similar. The reason to order one of these versus the other is this is a little bit cheaper, the TIBC. But gives you very similar information. Um, this number is reflective of the amount of iron transporter protein floating around in the blood. Okay? So if this number is low, that means that the transferrin is well saturated. Okay? So that means there's a lot of circulating iron. To calculate your iron percent saturation, which you'll commonly see on the lab reports, you divide these two numbers, iron and the total iron binding capacity. So if this number is very low, this number is very high, then the number becomes high. And that's what we see classically with genetic iron overload. Uh, of note, uh, hemoglobins are typically normal. So many secondary iron overload conditions come with anemias. And so it's important to recognize that if a patient presents with a normal hemoglobin, that's more consistent with the diagnosis of hemochromatosis. Here are some other conditions that can commonly present um, with abnormal iron studies. So we're going to talk about hepcidin. Hepcidin is an iron regulatory protein that's secreted by the liver and participates in a feedback loop of inhibition with ferroportin. Ferroportin is a um, molecule on the basal lateral surface of the enterocyte, so basically your small intestine, that transports iron into the blood. Okay? So this hepcidin is responsible for shutting off ferroportin when you have too much iron on board. Okay? So it's a feedback loop, just like your thyroid loop or any other endocrine loop. All right? So when there is uh, abnormal production or odd production of hepcidin, iron problems can ensue. Okay? And here's a simple pathway of this. The point to make here is that iron is absorbed through the enterocyte, but much of the regulation goes in through the liver, and that's where a lot of these issues start. So abnormal hepcidin production can lead to uncontrolled iron absorption, all right? And this is where you get the excess iron in your liver, heart, pancreas. Uh, mutations in the genes that control hepcidin are the problem. It's not the hepcidin that's the problem. It's the way it's controlled, okay? So here's your normal homeostasis of iron absorption. Classically, there's a fine balance between hepcidin and iron in the body. When hepcidin is unavoidably low, inappropriately low, ferroportin runs wild and iron overload then ensues. So here's the normal distribution of iron. Uh, in, a, in a Western diet, we eat about 1 to 2 milligrams per day of iron. That's absorbed into the proximal small intestine. All right? And then it's divvied up through a variety of organs, about 300 milligrams each in bone marrow and muscle. Uh, about four milligrams only in plasma transferrin, about a gram in the liver, and then about 250 milligrams in the red blood cells. And this is why phlebotomy is so, works so well, because the lion's share of iron stores in the body are actually maintained in the red blood cells. Red blood cells only have a life of about 120 days, so the body has to be very efficient in processing and uh, managing this iron, or you can get iron overload. It's then stored through this protein ferritin, and through desquamation or in ladies' menstruation, you lose about one to two milligrams per day. This is why women typically show up a little bit later with iron overload, because they auto-phlebotomize once a month. All right, so iron transport. So I'm not going to get too much in the weeds on this, but in basic terms, non-heme iron is taken into the enterocyte via this transporter. In order to move it across the small intestinal um, cell, uh, it's... Um, it's reduced from ion from uh, Fe3 plus to Fe2 plus. Once it's inside the cell, it can then be put into ferritin or continue along the pathway into circulation through uh, the transferrin uh, bind. So 
Ferroportin, which is down here, is located on the bottom or the basal lateral surface of the enterocyte, and it's responsible for transporting iron into circulation. And, and so this is, if this is running wild, iron overload ensues. Once it gets back into circulation, uh, it can then be oxidized from ferrous back into the ferric state, uh, and then can immediately be bound to plasma transferrin. So in iron deficiency, here is your pathway. Your serum iron is low. The liver senses this. It drops hepcidin, which reduces the inhibition of ferroportin. Transferrin receptor goes up, transferrin goes up, and you absorb iron. That's the way it's supposed to work, all right? In iron excess, that system should turn off because hepcidin is upregulated. So if the ferritin goes up, the liver turns up hepcidin, slows down ferroportin, decreases transferrin reception, transferrin goes down, iron absorption goes down. So let's talk about how this wouldn't work, all right? So HFE mutations, which are uh, the mnemonic of H, hemochromatosis, FE, iron, that's how it got its name. Genes are needed to internalize transferrin and iron in the hepatocyte, in the liver tissue, okay? So if this is mutated, the liver cells don't know that you have iron excess, all right? So it just continues to uh, reduce the hepcidin that's produced from the liver. And so ferroportin runs wide open, okay? And through this excess intestinal proximal iron absorption, iron overload ensues. So the point here is the physiology of what's going on is in the gut, all right? But the problem is in the liver. And this is why when we do liver transplants on patients with hereditary hemochromatosis, they may still have iron overload, but they shouldn't continue to absorb excess iron after the transplant. So HFE-associated hemochromatosis. All right, the most common version of this is associated with a gene mutation for this gene here on chromosome 6 called C282Y. Okay, so when you order your HFE gene mutations in the clinic, you're going to see the initial screen, which is for C282Y. If you have two copies, which is homozygous, if you have two copies, then the disease had about a, has about a 50 to 90% penetrance. That means that you have the genes and you actually manifest the disease. This is very interesting because in no studies do all patients who have genetic markers for hemochromatosis develop iron overload. Everyone doesn't. We don't really know why that is. Um, then maybe there's some other genes that we haven't identified yet. Maybe there's another pathway. We're not sure, but this is not 100%. The way you pick these patients up is mom and dad had the disease. They come and bring the kid in for screening, and they have the gene markers, but they don't have iron overload. So those are the patients that you would see. There's two other gene mutations that we have to talk about. And we commonly refer to these as the sidecar mutations because typically by themselves they don't do much. H63D and S65C, okay? Those two genes only tend to cause iron overload if there is already a C282Y on board, all right? So uh, if you do have a combination of these two, so let's say you have a C282Y and an H63D or and an S65C, you only have about a 5% chance of iron overload. So only one out of 20 of these patients is going to develop iron overload. This is really important clinically, okay? So if you have a patient in your primary practice who comes in with a ferritin of 350 and a normal iron percent sat, and they have a gene mutation that's consistent with this, they only have a 1 in 20 chance of actually having genetic iron overload. You need to be thinking about other reasons that their ferritin would be elevated, okay? So just a little brush up. I know everybody remembers all the genetics they ever learned. Uh, but just to brush up really quickly, here's mom and dad. Dad has one copy of C282Y. Mom is wild type. She doesn't have them. They have four children. So two of the children will be carriers for the C282Y mutation. So nobody should be manifesting disease here. All right? Second possibility is mom has hemochromatosis. She has two copies of the C282Y gene. Dad's a wild type. That means all the children will be carriers, but none of them should develop genetic iron overload. Takes two to tango, right? So if you don't have another copy here, you're just going to have a bunch of carriers. Now, let's say mom has one copy of H63D, dad has one copy of C282Y. Neither of them manifest the disease, but here we have little Timmy, who unfortunately got both copies, and he has a 1 in 20 chance of developing genetic iron overload. So HFE-associated hemochromatosis, this, the homozygous C282Y patients are almost always Northern European in ancestry. One out of every 200 people is homozygous for C282Y in that demographic, all right? So that means that 5.8% of people from Northern Europe at least carry one copy of this mutation, all right? And there's still controversy as to whether or not we should be targeted population screening people, 
even though this is a prevalence of 6% in a population, which is very interesting. So again, heterozygotes only have about a 5% chance of developing iron overload. And classically, if you just have one of these other two mutations, you do not carry significant risk for clinical iron overload. The epidemiology affected by one in 250 Caucasian people will have this disease. One in 150 in uh, genetic studies. Again, we already spoke about the fact that this tends to present a little bit later in women, uh, typically because of menstrual loss. Most cases are unsuspected. And there is a little bit of population-based data that even heterozygotes for the C282I mutation have an increased risk of certain malignancies. Breast cancer, colon cancer, liver cancer. This has not been confirmed in a lot of studies, but there's some population data to suggest this, which is very interesting. Screening for hemochromatosis. Currently, the guidelines from the AASLD, which is the American Liver Disease Society, as well as the European societies, are to screen people who have high risk factors, meaning a family member, or they have symptoms. But nobody has really put in a guideline that we need to be screening, targeted screening for Northern Europeans. Now, the people who write these guidelines, you can go find editorials where they say they think it's a good idea. And I imagine the cheaper that next generation sequencing gets and the more available it's going to be, we will be stepping towards this. Here at Mayo Clinic, we screen anybody with a Northern European ancestry over the age of 18. I can tell you that I've picked up a few with that pathway. Children are not typically screened, so you don't need to tell your patients that they need to have their kids screened before they turn 18. Diagnosis and staging. So when we screen for hereditary hemochromatosis and iron overload, we're typically looking at transferrin and serum, transfer, serum uh, transferrin saturation, which we spoke about a minute ago. If either of these is suggestive of iron overload, then we move on to this HFE panel, which is very easy to order in PCO. You just type in HFE, and it comes up. It's the only gene test that you can get. When you order that gene test, they will do these three tests for you. They do not report S65C unless C282I is positive. So if a patient calls you and says, oh, they didn't test me for this, it's because this wasn't positive. Again, only about a 50 to 90% chance of developing iron overload, even with the classic phenotype. And the patients that we have to pay specific attention to are those with very elevated ferritins, over 1,000, with the classic gene mutations. Those patients are at a much higher risk for developing complications, fibrosis, malignancies. And so we're a lot more aggressive with these patients than we would be with someone else. So here's our flow diagram of how we make the diagnosis. Elevated serum uh, uh, transferrin saturation or an elevated ferritin, which again, our threshold is a little bit lower in females because of the reasons that we mentioned. If those are elevated, we move on to our mutation panel. If this is suggestive of hereditary hemochromatosis, in 2017, we actually have two options and not one anymore. We're able to do these fancy MRIs with a calculation called the T2 star. If you ever read an MRI report and it refers to a T2 star, that is the rate at which the protons are spinning in relation to the iron, okay? The lower the number, the higher the iron concentration. So if you get somebody with a very, very low T2 star number, that's suggestive of significant hepatic iron overload. This technology has been used for a long time in cardiac MRI. It's how they've made the diagnosis for cardiac MRI. And it's been translated into uh, liver tissue now, which is great for us. Um, we still sometimes end up with liver biopsies. It happens sometimes. We try to avoid it, but in many cases, we don't have a choice. Either there's too much iron, and with too much iron, we're not able to quantify the amount of scar tissue in the liver because of that. Uh, or there's a question of a non-HFE uh, associated, sometimes we end up with a biopsy. Let's say these are not mutated. Then you have to think about other causes for elevated iron studies, or we go down this road of further genetic testing, which we'll talk about in a second. Is the liver biopsy just to determine if they have their process, or does it determine if there's a problem in the liver? So all you're going to find out with your liver biopsy is how much iron is there, where the iron is in relation to the liver cells or into the other storage cells in the liver, and if there's scar tissue. So you find out those three things. You don't find out any other information on their genetic piece. All right, so hyperferritinemia, which is the most, reason, most common reason we see patients. Uh, people have elevated ferritins. Remember that alcohol, inflammatory conditions, metabolic syndromes can all elevate uh, this number. Uh, in iron overload, if the iron is primarily stored in the liver parenchyma, but there is not classic mutation. You have to think about uh, non-transfusion dependent thalassemia, some other uh, advanced liver disease, and you can think about non-HFE hemochromatosis. If it's primarily present in the Kupfer cells and you have splenic iron, you can think about this condition called ferroportin disease, which we'll talk about in a second. 
Severe anemia, we think about transfer anemias, sideroblastic anemias. And if there's associated neurological symptoms, you can think about this zebra called acerulaplasmanemia. So staging the disease. Liver biopsies are sometimes needed. All right, We have these fancy elastographies now that allow us to get a lot more information from the liver than we used to be able to via radiographic testing. Uh, we have our MRI T2 star, which is helpful. Of note, it's not helpful in the pancreas. Because of the gland tissue in the pancreas, we can't quantify iron very well. And again, we think about these patients that are over 40 with a high ferritin as being patients we would be more likely to do a definitive biopsy for. Hepatic elastography, a very fancy technology that uses sound waves to shake the liver like a jello mold. If it sounds soft or if it sounds hard, that's how you can determine if there's scar tissue. Okay. Completely pain-free, no side effects, very safe procedure to do, and we do this very regularly now. There's two pathways. One is FibroScan, which is an ultrasound-based version of this, uh, or MRI elastography. I can tell you that newer ultrasound equipment, is some of it is equipped with this non-proprietary technology called ShearWave. ShearWave is very similar to FibroScan. So my suspicion is that over the next 10 years, the new ultrasound machines, you'll be able to get a bedside assessment of fibrosis very quickly, point of care. Non-HFE-associated iron overload, there are these four conditions that are very rare, but they do exist, and we'll talk about them. So classic HFE-associated hemochromatosis typically is autosomal recessive, elevated iron stores, tends to come on in the fourth, fifth decade of life, and is associated with low hepcidin. There are two genetic diseases that typically affect younger folks. They're very rare. They're also autosomal recessive. Tend to present in the second or third decade with cardiomyopathies, or hypogonadism, uh, and they are also associated with low hepcidin. Transferrin-2 receptor deficiency looks just like hereditary hemochromatosis. Uh, it looks just like the classic version. It's just a rarer genetic version. Okay? Ferroportin disease is the, uh, the one difference here. It is an autosomal dominant condition. The disease is not with hepcidin. It's with ferroportin. So ferroportin basically runs wild on its own, uh, and we'll talk about that disease specifically in a second. So whole exome sequencing has allowed us a lot cheaper and faster pathway to be able to make the diagnosis of non-HFE hemochromatosis. We do these whole exome sequencing tests. This is a proposed algorithm from a couple years ago. If we're worried about it, then we can do the confirmation nucleotide sequencing. Our genetics team is able to do this very quickly for us now. Global prevalence. So the non-HFE uh, non mutations, we won't get in the weeds here, but essentially the range of these three mutations is pretty small, 0 0.00007 to 0 0.005 rate of prevalence. And with our autosomal dominant pathway here of ferroportin disease, a little bit more common, 0 0.0004 is the prevalence. So ferroportin disease is an autosomal dominant condition. For those of you who would have to take boards on this, you're typically looking for an, an African person who has anemia, and their biopsy would show cut for cell iron, iron stored in a little different spot. These patients uh, are very difficult to treat because they already have anemia. So a lot of times they end up on iron binders. Risk of malignancy. There is a 24-fold risk of hepatocellular cancer in patients with hereditary hemochromatosis. That's not a small number. Okay? And there's also some population-based data that C2A2I homozygotes are at an increased risk for liver cancer, breast cancer, and colorectal cancer. Okay? So it's important to identify these patients. There's not currently any recommendations for increasing screening frequency for these other two malignancies at this time. These are also associated with an increased risk, but that's based on population data. Uh, but the rarity of these non-HFE-associated uh, hemochromatosis conditions makes us very unable to determine if there's a high risk of malignancy. This, this will end up being something I imagine we do with further genetic testing in the future. Diets. There's no specific diet recommended by the ASLD. Uh, diets uh, would... Expert opinion, which doesn't include me, other experts too, all say that dietary changes are reasonable to discuss with the patient for a variety of reasons. One is you empower your patients. Okay. The second thing is you are minimizing maintenance phlebotomy and in some cases accelerating induction phlebotomy. Okay. It's not just about low iron. It's about other things like vitamin C. Vitamin C is a cofactor in iron absorption. We typically tell our patients to avoid alcohol and try to live a relatively healthy lifestyle. Treatments, therapeutic phlebotomy, okay? We reduce the amount of iron in the body by bloodletting, okay? We don't use leeches anymore. They come to apheresis. Uh, the goal of ferritin is typically 50 to 100. This reverses some, but not all of the complications. So there are patients who will get arthralgias, cirrhosis specifically, and infertility 
who do not respond to bloodletting, unfortunately. And so these patients need to be managed in other ways. Iron overload does increase the risk of cancer, specifically liver cancer. So we know that if you reduce the iron overload in the body, you are reducing their chances of developing malignancy. Um, phlebotomy is initially performed two to four times a month. This is usually when, the way we do it, removing a pint of blood each time. So about 200 to 250 milligrams of iron. So say 100 to 200 days worth of iron you're removing with that one to two number that we spoke about earlier. And again, this blood is safe to be given to other patients. So you will not give a, a, a donor, uh, you will not give the recipient iron overload by giving them this blood. It's safe to use. It does require a sticker. The FDA requires that you put an, a hemochromatosis sticker on the blood, but it's totally safe to use it. So is your um, hospital um, like having these people to donate their blood? Right. So instead of throwing it away, yep. like, we allow them to come to the blood bank here. If they come to apheresis, then sometimes it gets thrown away. So Depends. We're working on that. Okay. Yes. It's one of my pet projects. So induction phase every one to two weeks, we try to keep their threshold hemoglobin greater than 12. We try to get their ferritins and their percent sats down a bit to reduce their iron overload. So medical chelation is not uh, as commonly used in primary iron overload. More commonly, this ends up being medication that we need to use for secondary iron overload. Our hematology colleagues use this a lot more than we have to, thankfully, because it's expensive and it causes a lot of side effects, okay? Rarely do we have to use this in classic hereditary hemochromatosis patients. And again, liver transplantation is curative. It doesn't cure their iron overload, but it does uh, reverse their genetic problem. And so they should be able to maintain iron homeostasis once they've been appropriately phlebotomized. So this is just an interesting study that I'm going to end this part of the talk with. And that is that uh, in these patients who are just carriers for HFE mutations who have sickle cell disease, those with care, there were carriers for the HFE mutation had more iron overload than those that didn't. So this would argue that maybe there is a spectrum here of patients who don't have all the classic gene mutations but are still at risk for iron overload if they take a second hit. If they have uh, sickle cell anemia or they have other, another reason for, um, for iron overload, it may be a, a contributor, which is an interesting point to uh, research in the future. So let's talk about our clinic. Uh, we started this in June. It's a comprehensive clinic. We do evaluation and treatment typically in one to two days, which keeps us in line with being a destination medical center. They see me, they see a nutritionist, they see a genetic counselor, they get blood testing, imaging, any, uh, any procedures that they need done, and then if they're local, they can get their phlebotomies here, or they can get their phlebotomies back home. Uh, how does it start? So somebody calls CAO, the central appointment office, with this diagnosis, or maybe an outside provider places a direct referral to me or to uh, the condition of hemochromatosis or iron overload. I've gotten a lot of referrals from all of you in this room. Thank you so much. Um, and this is how they end up uh, through our pathway. So I've gotten a bunch of referrals through this video that we launched last June at when I put this in the computer, uh, 3,600 views in 11 months, so about 10 views a day, something like that. Nine of those are probably my mom, but uh, <laughs> at least we're getting some coverage. I can tell you that more than half of the new evals that I get are patients who saw this video and called for an appointment. So once the CAO gets plugged in, we have a pre-scheduling algorithm, which I highly recommend you do in your own practice if you're not already doing it. They get pre-scheduled for blood work, a visit with me, all the advanced imaging, the MRIs, the elastography, T2 star, the cardiac screen, nutrition, genetics, it's all pre-scheduled. So they can, when they come here, they can get all of it done and leave in a reasonable amount of time. We get our uh, wonderful secretaries and assistants. Darlene, my secretary, I, I don't know what I would do without her collects all of my outside records, sorts them for me. We get all of the outside liver biopsies and imaging interpreted before the patient ever gets here, which is great. Blood work, CBCs, fun, uh, kidney function and liver enzyme panels. We do a limited assessment for viral, autoimmune, and metabolic causes of liver disease. We do a limit, limited endocrine fun, dysfunction screen, diabetes, adrenal insufficiency, gonadal screen, those things. Uh, nutrition consult, our nutritionists are great. They've really been able to plug our patients in with some cool ways to limit the iron if they need to have a low iron diet, uh, iPhone apps that they have, as well as in many cases, we end up converting their nutrition visit to a heart healthy, low fat, low diabetic diet. And that ends up being great education for them either way. Uh, genetics consult, we pre-schedule. I then just cancel it if we don't think we need it, but you'd be surprised how many times we do. If non-HFE disease is suspected, then they have labs that will perform for all of those other non-HFE genetic mutations that we discussed. 
and they're able to offer genetic counseling. They're able to reassure patients that they don't need to get their nine-year-old screened for hemochromatosis, uh, which is very valuable to the patients. So where do our patients come from? I made this slide last week. Uh, we've, we've done a pretty good job of hitting everywhere in Florida. We've had some branch outs here. I like that this patient drove right past Mayo, Arizona, got on a plane and flew to see us. It's great. <laughs> and I, he did do that. That's true. Um, so we're uh, just in 11 months, we've been able to, um, to pull patients from uh, good regions of the country. So we're excited about that. Um, this is a recent story uh, that one of our grateful patients uh, volunteered to give. Um, he's a fantastic guy with non-HFE hemochromatosis who uh, couldn't say enough about had anything to do with me. It had to do with all these other people that helped with this pre-scheduling and the process. And a great guy who um, was kind enough to say nice things about us, which is always good. Um, so our iron overload registry, through a generous grant from our Digestive Disease Research Subcommittee, we now have a fully funded prospective SDMS database, which is what all the big boys use. It's a prospective database that houses all of our clinical, demographic, uh, labs, imaging, everything that gets done. Every time the patients come, it gets logged in here. We've seen 46 patients in our 11 months, okay? And we've able to pull another 1,000 patients based on Mayo billing codes, anybody that had the HFE mutations done, genetic orders, they're all going to be in here too. Uh, the data is mined by us, as well as some of our summer Chris students, who I think are floating around here. Um, so uh, we're very excited to have this full and, and have future projects uh, in the works. This is our team. Uh, I've been extremely fortunate to be joined by uh, Dr. Vishnu, who was a fellow here and then went off... Uh, to the great beyond and then came back to us and has been a great ally of mine in hematology. My mentors, Candido Rivera and Doug Rieger Johnson, who have just been great. Uh, Drew Bowman, who's taken a radiographic interest in iron overload and has helped us with a lot of our protocols. We've got specific protocols written for MRIs for iron overload now, which are just great. Um, our genetics team, Dr. Atwal, Jessica Jackson, and Sarah Macklin, who've been wonderful and getting our patients in quickly uh, to be seen. And then our nutrition team, Leanne Kendesiman, who's been wonderful with our patients and educating them on iron overload. So our goals, we want to make this the best iron center in the world. That's the goal. There should be nowhere else that you should need to go other than here for this. That allows us to build a database and investigate these non-HFE mutations. We don't have a lot of data on them. Hopefully we will in the future. We want to develop a network for external providers. Not everybody's able to get on a plane and fly to Jacksonville to see their patients. So we want to be sure that we have a network available for providers and patients out there that can educate themselves on iron overload and what they need to do for their condition. If you have any trouble getting your patient in, pick up the phone and tone page me. Call page me directly. We'll get them in. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.